Maude Barlow came to prominence in the 1980s when Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney proposed to negotiate with U.S. President Ronald Reagan the first comprehensive free trade treaty in the world. Maude opposed it, and now 30 years later she hasn't changed her mind. As chair of the Council of Canadians, she is still battling these anti-democratic treaties. There are now 3,000 such treaties around the world, and new ones are being proposed all the time. One of the most alarming things she found in that first battle was that these treaties effectively privatize water, one of the fundamental necessities of life, by making water a tradable good. And that led her to look at the whole creeping crisis of the global water supply and how it's being affected by irrigation, pollution, hydroelectric power, corporate greed, climate change, and much more. In three books, the latest just published, she's explored every aspect of the human relationship with water and the danger we face from the ways we misuse it. Just one example of the results. The Aral Sea, once one of the four largest lakes in the world. Today, it's mostly a salty desert with a few patches of water here and there. Should Canadians and Americans care about that? Yep. As Maud explains, our own Great Lakes are on the same road to destruction. Here's Maud. Well, I got involved in the free trade fight with the very first free trade agreement in the world, which is the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, which was launched by <clears throat> Brian Mulroney and Ronald Reagan, who was then President of the United States back in the 1980s. And uh, I was opposed for many reasons. I came out of the women's movement and I was very worried that we were going to harmonize our social programs to those of uh, the Ronald Reagan uh, United States, um, which happened to, to happen as a matter of fact. We had a very high rise in child poverty and so on <clears throat> over those next uh, two decades. Um, but So that was my original interest, but when I started looking at these trade agreements I realized it was also a way for corporations to to cut back on the ability, democratic ability of governments to maintain control over their resources, environmental standards, health and safety standards, labor standards, and so on. And it was in that first trade agreement that I noticed that water was a tradable good. That's, that's what set me on the path on water. So all these years later, I feel totally, completely vindicated in my uh, analysis of trade. <coughs> In the North American Free Trade Agreement, they added this concept of investor state where corporations can bypass their own government and directly sue the government of another country if they dare to try to bring in standards, environmental or whatever. Um, and it's given corporations an enormous power. Um, there are now close to 3,000 bilateral trade and investment agreements in the world, and most of them contain this investor state where corporations can sue governments. And so I think that the free trade and these investor state agreements have been a, probably the most important tool that corporations have had to get past government authority and a democracy. And I feel totally vindicated in my very first uh, opinion of trade, free trade, which is that it's not free at all. That comes with a terrible cost to people and the environment. Mm. Tell me some more about the investor state uh, uh, dispute process because I think very people few people know. have, I know. have I any know. understanding of that <coughs> or even know that it exists. I think people are going to know more about it as the cases come forward and people say, well, why does that corporation, why does that fracking corporation from the United States get to challenge Quebec's ban on moratorium on fracking or why does that um, pesticide company, a drug company get to, ban to challenge another ban on pesticides? Like, Wait. So I think when people start to see it in, in person, they start to understand it. But investor state is the right for a corporation to sue the, of one country, to sue the government of another country if that country brings in laws or regulations that weren't in place when they first invested. So if you invest in a country and there are very lax environmental rules, but say that government changes and they want to bring in better environmental rules and they try to do that, <clears throat> Everyone has to obey, but if you're a foreign investor protected by investor state agreement, you can sue that government for millions, even potentially billions of dollars in compensation because that's not what was expected. That's not the anticipation you had when you went in there. It started out as a concept for wealthy country corporations going into areas of the global south where they were worried that countries would nationalize. So you go in and you set up a mine and I saw there'd be a coup and they'd take back the mining industry, right? Um, so that's what it was originally for. It was that kind of expropriation, nationalization. 
but now they apply it to any rule, any law, any change in the law. For instance, if Alberta were to suddenly say, look, we are running out of water, which they are, um, and we are going to tell all of the oil and gas companies, you have to cut your water use in half. Right across the board, you have 10 years to do it. Bingo, we're bringing in a law. The American companies operating in the tar sands would have the right to sue for financial compensation because that wasn't the condition under which they invested in the first place. So what it does is it prevents governments from bringing in the kind of legislation that their people want. They are literally prevented, you could say, the trade agreement or the investment agreement made me do it. I can't, governments don't have that policy space. And I'll give you one example, uh, an example of Abitibi Bowater, which is an American pulp and paper company that operated in Newfoundland for many, many years, created jobs, <clears throat> and left on their own a number of years ago because they went bankrupt, turned around and said, oh, left pensions behind, jobs and pensions, uh, said they can't afford, the, couldn't afford to pay the pensions. It said to the government of Newfoundland, but we want to be paid for the water rights we left behind. And the government of Newfoundland said, excuse us, that's our water. Why would we give you these money for this? You've left voluntarily. Um, so they ch used a Chapter 11 challenge under NAFTA, which you have to le level with the federal government because it's the federal government that signs these trade agreements. So they laid a Chapter 11 challenge asking for millions of dollars and the Harper government, instead of going to bat for Newfoundland and at least trying to find it, fight it out at an NAFTA panel, settled. Gave them $130 million, which basically says now that any corporation in North America, and I expect you could use this as an example around the world, but certainly under NAFTA, it has now been established that these corporations have the right <coughs> to claim ownership of the water that they use if they're operating in another country. And this is how water gets transferred from public to private in ways that we don't even see because it's all done through protection of these investor state agreements. I, you know, I haven't seen that implication. I know a little about that TV case, but, uh, but I hadn't quite seen it. Yeah, of course, they're being compensated for water that they owned, or they, in effect, that they owned. Any energy company, any big American agribusiness company, any big American chemical company, any mining company that is needs water for its operations here <coughs> could claim ownership. Conversely, we could do the same in Canada, but of course it's more, it tends more to be American corporations operating here. And this proposed European agreement, CETA, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, would give European corporations the same rights in Canada as American companies have under investor states. So for instance, we're fighting the privatization of a number of water services across the country where the federal government under Harper, because he's very right wing, has basically said to all the municipalities, if you want funding for new infrastructure for water, wastewater services and so on, the only way you're going to get federal funding is if you go to a public-private partnership, if you privatize your water system. So these municipalities are saying, well, it's really, I don't have a lot of choice. And so we're beginning to see the privatization of water services across the country. Now, the two biggest private water corporations, the biggest utilities in the world, are from Europe. They're from France, Veolia and Suez. So basically, once you have them privatized and these companies involved and established here, and then you have a comprehensive economic and trade agreement that gives investor state rights, you can never take it back. A future municipal government would say, it's costing us a fortune, we think the company's doing a terrible job, which by the way is happening all over the world. Uh, uh, cities are remunicipalizing their water, taking it back into public control. You wouldn't be able to under this agreement because these two companies would have the ability to sue for financial compensation, which would make it way too expensive. So not only does it do these investor state agreements lock in the lowest standard, the lowest common denominator, but they lock it in quite permanently because it is so expensive to be allowed to buy your way to a higher standard. And you've actually destroyed your own sovereignty, right? Well, it, you do, and you do it by ways that seem incremental, but in my belief is absolutely deliberate. I absolutely believe that the Harper govern, government knows exactly what it's doing. They cannot undo certain things in this country because Canadians care too deeply about them. But if they put them in jeopardy, if they put them in a grip, a lock, uh, through these trade and investment agreements, then they have sealed it for, with future generations. Harper can retire and be very happy and go on to his reward on boards and make gazillions of dollars and think, I did it permanently. It's not just 
while I'm here, <clears throat> and then maybe a different government will undo it. No, while I, if we lock it in with these investor state agreements, it's locked in uh, for, for many, many, many years. Give you one other example, and this is the agreement with China that we are fighting, and this is a, an agreement that, that Harper is planning to sign, this foreign investment uh, promotion and, and uh, protection agreement. Um, and basically, state-owned companies in China, which are already, for instance, operating in the tar sands, would have the right to sue under th this agreement, this investor state, if, for instance, BC says no to the pipeline or the Eastern Pipeline gets stopped. These companies will be able to say, we invested billions of dollars in the tar sands under the under, with the understanding that we were going to be able to export what we produce through these pipelines. If these pipelines don't get built, that's a change in the agreement or the understanding that we had when we invested here. So what happens is you get a collusion in this case with the, with the, uh, the government of a superpower promoting a particular model of energy development in our country that most Canadians don't want. But it locks you in and it locks future generations in and that's in a way the most dangerous thing about it. There's an Alice in Wonderland quality to that because the pipelines don't exist now. The I change know. would be to build them. I know. The change is not not to I build know. them. I know. Yeah. Now, yeah. wouldn't it be nice if we could give communities and environmentalists and so on the right to sue if you do do something? <laughs> but there's no such agreement, you see. And here's the other thing people don't understand, and that is that at the United Nations, if we sign, if, if we adopt a new human rights code or we si sign an international environmental agreement, it means something, but it's also voluntary. Nobody can make you do anything. The only place that has real teeth with real consequences, the only kind of agreement, are these trade and investment agreements because both corporations and governments can come back and punish you for breaking the, the terms of the agreement. Now you could say, well, technically it's, it's, it's you know, everybody's equal. The United States is equal to Ecuador. Mm -hmm. Uh-uh. <laughs> bears, bears are equal to squirrels, uh -huh. right? I mean, let's be yeah, honest. Yeah. The big corporations, the, and this is a real case, you know, a, a big American energy company suing little Ecuador and, and, and getting huge settlement is hardly going to happen in reverse. You're hardly going to get a little company from Ecuador, you know, suing the United States of, uh, uh, of America. So basically, while technically this looks equal on paper, what's happening is that the big companies, the big companies, corporations and the big industry sectors as a whole group are cleaning up. And I can show you agreement after agreement, case after case, where the environment loses and these corporations are making money. One of the things that this strikes me as quite bizarre and, and, and you would think would be a point of resistance but doesn't seem to be, is that, is that <coughs> a foreign corporation can sue a government for purely imaginary, mm. for the loss of purely imaginary profits, profits that it didn't get to make, not pro they didn't okay. lose anything really, they, it's all, but a domestic company can't. Now you would think that the domestic corporation would be saying, wait a minute, you cannot have the Ethel Corporation able to sue the government of Canada and my company, which is a Canadian company, yeah. unable to sue yeah. over similar things. It is one of the anomalies of this thing that I have never understood and that is why Canadian companies put up with the fact that they do not have the same rights to sue if a government or any provincial or any level of government in Canada brings in legislation that's going to cost them lost profit whereas these foreign corporations have the right to sue. People who don't understand it say you're just giving foreign corporations a level playing field. No you're not. You're giving them a very special treatment <clears throat> they get the right to sue and therefore to, to force governments to back off on proposed legislation that, that uh, domestic companies don't have. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to remember that the big Canadian companies, like the big mining industry, really have gone global. And they see it in terms of what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And if it's good for American corporations or European corporations or Chinese corporations to be able to sue the Canadian government for environmental standards, we want the same rights when we operate around the world. And so they collude in that they, I, I think maybe it's different for small business, but the big guys want to be bigger, they go global, they want those same investor state rights when they operate in other parts of the world. And believe me, our mining companies are the worst in the world. The, they've got the worst environmental record, the worst human rights record. I mean, if you 
walk through Latin America or certainly Central America, bore an American flag <laughs> and don't wear a Canadian flag because they don't like Canadians there. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the reputation of our mining company. So they want the same investor state rights to be able to misbehave in those countries as we've given corporations from other countries to operate here. And that's who Harper listens to. Yeah, it's really interesting because all these corporations are, are in a sense reaching out of their native territory and, and in a sense, I guess the calculation could very well be, okay, I'm giving up some power in Canada to other corporations here, right. but I've got 192 other countries in yeah. which I have exactly. additional power. So giving up my domestic situation Giving up your domestic that. rights is a small price to pay for getting them internationally if you think of yourself as a global corporation. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, in Canada, these corporations, Canadian corporations, have enormous industri uh, industrial clout. I mean, we know, for instance, that the majority of the cuts, uh, the gutting of the environmental rules to protect freshwater that the government of Harper has done over the last few years was laid out in a letter by the ener Canadian energy sector to the Harper government. They said, this is what we want done, we know this, and Greenpeace got a hold of the, the letter. They basically said, these are the pieces of legislation that are costing us money, these we want you to take away. So they, you know, it's not like poor little Canadian companies are hurting here. I mean, these Canadian companies are colluding to bring those standards down. So it happens in a variety of ways. You get the Canadian energy industry pushing to have the gutting of these freshwater protections and, and lowering of standards on air, air quality standards and so on. And then you get the foreign corporations saying, yes, and if you even try, to bring any standards in, uh, we'll sue you. So it's kind of a double whammy, and I am very convinced they work together. I mean, what they want is the lowest playing level playing field. They want the base. They want a basement, not a ceiling, in terms of the environment, and they go after it in a whole bunch of ways. Yeah. Tell me about provincial procurement, because I think that's that, that's in a sense the new frontier in all this inequity, right? <coughs> so <coughs> the comprehensive the U Canada European Union Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement (CEDA) is the first in the world which would really start looking at what they call subnational governments, and that's provincial and municipal. And that's the lion's share of, of taxpayers' funding, is not federal. The, the majority of the money that's spent is spent by municipalities and provinces, health and roads and police and, you know, everything, water services, all of that, those are municipal and provincial. And so for the first time, this agreement is actually looking to bring the discipline of trade agreements and investment agreements to these subnational governments. And we're deeply opposed, for the same reason we were opposed <coughs> at having federal government's hands tied, we're now opposed to having provincial and municipal hands tied in terms of uh, who they can decide to uh, award money to. They're basically, this agreement would outlaw the right to have ec local economic plans based on local employment, giving any kind of favor to local business, local food, uh, you know, local farmers, anything a around promoting, you know, say a hospital wants to only, um, you know, procure local food for, to, to give to its patients, all of those things are challengeable. Bottled water, you wouldn't be able to bring in a bottled water ban because that would be discriminatory against a company like uh, Nestle, which is European and so on. So it's really a, a, a taking these same rules that we've been talking about and just bringing them down in, into every facet of our lives, including how we spend daycare money, how we spend our health care money. You would not be able to discriminate in favor of the local. And that means you can't discriminate in t favor of what you might think is better, what you might think is good for the economy, what you might think is, is going to keep more local protection. It's just another level of, of, of giving over power to corporations, and particularly global corporations. I just look at um, one struggle that we, we were looking at here in Ontario, and that's um, bus drivers, the, uh, rural bus drivers who drive those yellow buses, and they're mostly farmers or farm, you know, the, the mm -hmm. spouse in making a little extra money. Um, all it's going to all be challengeable by a company like Veolia, which is the big uh, transportation and water uh, company from, from France. They'll want to run all the bus services. And that, you won't be able to say, well, we, you know, we, we, we value rural communities, we value the rural way of life, and we want to be able to use these bus services to, to promote that. All of that will be challengeable. 
it's a it's just a huge corporate grab and it's it's one I don't think Canadians understand because I think they think well we can see what was wrong with trade with the United States because they're big and they don't have good standards but Europe's got better environmental standards <coughs> better labor standards isn't it better to trade with them and when you say when you explain to people it's the same thing it's just a corporate grab and it's our corporations over there as well as their corporations over here it mm -hmm. isn't about rights of people and it is about um, lowering the standards, environmental, labor standards, working standards for everybody, everywhere. Isn't it interesting too that, the, that this always averages down? So oh. if the Swedes have a, a higher standard in some sphere than we do, we can't go back to the Swedes and say, no, you can't come to our country and demand that we accept less than you yeah. accept at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, we, <coughs> we could write a trade agreement that looked like that. We actually could. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. not against trade. Everybody thinks we are, you know. I eat bananas and we're never going to grow them here in Canada. I'm not against trade. But the trade agreements as they are written <coughs> are designed to limit the democratic power of all levels of government to maintain democratic controls and standards and to protect workers, to protect families, to protect local economies and communities, to protect the environment. They are designed <coughs> to give corporations the right to have a level playing field. They don't want to bump into higher standards from one country or one border to another. They want, they want the lowest common denominator. You could write a very different kind of trade agreement. In fact, in my new book, I talk about how we could write <coughs> agreements that protect water, that actually look at the virtual co water content. What is the water, the water that is used in the, the making or growing of a product or a commodity is just huge. You're exporting that out of your watershed. You're exporting the water right along with it. What if we, if in our trade agreements, we actually had to calculate how much water was being left with that ethanol or those beef exports or those grain exports or whatever? Boy, would that be a different equation. Then you'd have to say, well, the destruction of that watershed was never quite taken into account when we, when we signed that trade agreement. You could write trade agreements that actually take into account higher standards, joint high standards or joint good standards uh, on labor, on the environment, on health and safety standards. There's no reason that we couldn't do that. But our governments, particularly in our case the Harper government, is just in very deep collusion with the corporate sector and they, they write the rules. You know, you talked about the MAI, the Multilateral Agreement on Investment, which we won, as you'll remember. But I remember that <clears throat> when I first learned about it, I called, this was a liberal government, I called the Trade Department and I said, I've heard that there's this thing. And they said, oh, don't be silly, there's no such thing, you and your conspiracy theories. Well, it turns out very, very soon we got a hold of a leaked copy and we gave it to the newspapers and it was everywhere and suddenly the government discovered, oh yes, there was this MAI, they're so sorry. And they put up a website saying how great it was. Then we find out from Freedom of Information that they had been meeting with the corporate sector in Canada for three years. Three years they had been negotiating this thing. <clears throat> We're like three quarters f through it and not one Canadian knew about it. And I remember talking to a, a cabinet minister, a liberal cabinet minister at the time, who said to me, I knew nothing about it. It never came to cabinet. So that's how these things get done. It's kind of like there's the government you see and then there's this other thing that is actually building, building, building away at these trade and investor state agreements that basically give away a great deal of self-governance to corporations. And it limits the sphere in which governments can operate. So it used to be if you're kind of left, you're over here, and you're kind of right, you're over here. But this is the sphere, the sphere has gone like this. So you're kind of looking at each other. You don't have the policy room that you had in the past. Well, it really is, yeah, it really is uh, creeping totalitarianism. It is, it is, it is. It um, is. It's, a, it's a corporate coup in slow motion. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's striking is that the, the judgments are all in purely economic terms. I There's know. no other consideration. I know. I know. Um, yeah. But you see, I would argue that <coughs> even if you just look at it economically, take a look at where most Canadians are all these years after that first free trade agreement and NAFTA. Most Canadians are still, you know, struggling uh, with, with one or two, or sorry, two or three jobs. 
I describe the way our country has changed, and I will remind you that Brian Mulroney said, give me 20 years and you won't recognize this country. And he also used Harper's to say... people said, give he me says, five. Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well he, yeah. in fairness, Mulroney started it. Yeah. So. <clears throat> but you're right, Harper says <clears throat> the same thing, you know, I can do this fast. But he also used to say, we need the cold shower of competition. And the way I describe how we have changed demographically is that we used to look like a big egg with a big middle class and a smallish number of, of wealthy and a smallish number of poor in Canada because of decent social programs, we now look like a pair with fewer and fewer holding more and more power at the top, and those statistics are very clear, more and more in the lower middle class, just one or two paychecks away from disaster, and then that underclass that was created. And I would argue that was deliberate. I would argue that is an absolutely deliberate byproduct of the, of, the, of the cold shower of competition that was envisaged for this country. There's a belief that if you look after the elites, <coughs> the rest will follow. And I'm watching this in countries, for instance, and I'll just give you one example from my new book, uh, Karnataka, which is a state in India. Is they made a very clear decision to move swiftly, swiftly, like the Chinese, from peasant living and you know a peasant lifestyle to becoming what they call the Silicon Valley of India. <clears throat> They're putting their money into privatization, into free trade zones, into these call centers, into computer chips, like boom, boom, boom. And they are making a conscious decision to take their limited water supplies, and they are limited. We're talking 80, over 80 percent of the people there do not have sanitation in their homes. The open defecation in the fields we are, is the majority practice, right? So we're not talking lots of wealth here. We're talking mostly subsistence living, farming. And they are deliberately taking that money and putting it into this new economy. And their belief is, uh, sorry, the water, and taking this limited water and putting it into the new economy, and displacing millions of people from the land. And their thinking is, literally, it'll be better for everybody in the end. If we can convert, I know it'll hurt, we're going to convert to this new economy and we're going to do it, it'll hurt, and we're all going to pull together here except you couple of million people who are getting left behind, or actually three quarters of the population, or 90 percent of the population getting left behind. It's going to be better for everyone, and that is the view. If you've got the Harper mentality, and so I, it's, I don't think he's an unkind man, but I don't think his worldview allows him to, to see that shift from the egg to the pear, and what it feels like to be down at the bottom, <clears throat> and what it's going to mean to us as we start to run out of these resources that he is giving away so quickly. So let's, let's, let's switch our attention from, because I think what we've done so far is, is, is to, um, to probe the way in which we are, number one, we're frozen in time yes. because the situation cannot change without, without there being penalties from it. Right. And number two, we're frozen at the lowest possible level of caring, I guess, for ourselves, for the environment, for anything else. We're frozen and we're also locked into a, a series of judgments that are purely economic. No other considerations need apply, right, right? or can apply. And water is the, is the great case that you've been preoccupied with, which would be uh, frozen behind these protections, right? Yeah. But, yeah. So tell me, but there is, but let's start back with the whole issue of, of, a, of a global water crisis. Why do you say we have that? Well, our modern humanity has basically taken water for granted in a way that I would argue ancient peoples never did, and still First Nations and most peasant societies still don't today. I think probably it, it happened when people first were able to turn on a tap and divorce themselves from having to go to that water source and find it yourself or pull it up from the well or, you know, haul it yourself. And to be able to think that <clears throat> you could just turn on that tap and there was endless water. And a colleague uh, whose name is Jamie Linton, has written that we, we have created what he calls modern water, which is that we've taken the notion of waters and all of the, you know, the variety of waters and waters of place and waters of culture and waters of, <coughs> of religion or faith and, and uh, <coughs> waters that belong to history and time uh, and made it one water. And in, in creating this H2O, this, which is, well, I know it exists, but in defining it as this element, this resource, and then seeing it as one sort of circular hydrologic cycle going around that you can stick your straw into, we've transformed water into being a resource to build an industrial economy. 
And so we have not honored water. We have thought it can, you can dump whatever you want in it, you can move it wherever you want, you can grow whatever you want with it, and then ship that stuff away. It doesn't matter if it leaves the watershed. It doesn't matter what you do with it because you learn when you were a kid <clears throat> that you can't run out of it. The hydrologic cycle has got this finite but specific amount of water, it goes round and round, Bob's your uncle. Well, not true. We are polluting it, we are depleting it, and we are mismanaging it, and we are displacing it. And that's one of the big ones, is that we're taking it from where we can get at it, and we're either growing commodities that we ship away, or we're shipping it into big cities, and when those thirsty cities are done, they're dumping it in the ocean, which is one of the causes of the rises in ocean level. Um, we are literally taking water from where we can get at it to where we cannot. And the statistics are stunning. I mean, uh, the Ogallala Aquifer, the great aquifer of the U.S. Plains, will be gone in our lifetime, says the U.S. Department of Agriculture, once the biggest aquifer in the world. Using Borwell technology, they're just destroying it. That's making a bunch of farmers wealthy, or at least have, you know, decent living for some time, and it will be gone. Um, the Aral Sea, the Lake Chad, um, a, a new study from China that they're, mostly this is their, their use of their water for coal, for coal fire hydropower. Half the rivers in China since, since 1990 are gone. You can't exaggerate this. We have studies that tell us that the, the groundwater is being pumped at double the rate every 20 years, which means that we are pumping ancient fossil water faster than it can be replenished by nature. And we are coming to the bottom of that bathtub, if you want to have that image, uh, in many, many parts of the world. It doesn't mean it's not still here somewhere, but we have, we have cavalierly seen, we look at a river and we don't see a river, we see hydroelectric power. You know, we don't, and so most of the rivers, because we dam them for hydro, or we dam them for agriculture or whatever, and they don't reach the oceans. And that is an interruption in nature's cycle because the best spawning grounds, aquatic spawning grounds, are where the fresh water meets the uh, salt water. So we are taking the world's water and we're using up future generations' water stocks, like really, literally, as we sit here. And so I guess I want to sound the alarm that this, I started out on this issue rather in the more political sense on the side of the human right to water, which is something I've been deeply involved in. But the more I learn about it and the more I work with scientists, the more I'm convinced that you can have all the human rights in the world where if you're a planet running out of water, that's a crisis. That's a crisis now that we have to collectively um, start to understand. And it does come from this same attitude that these free trade agreements come from, that we're the king of the, you know, that, that humans are, are at the top of the pile and that certain humans are at the very top of that pile and they belong there and that you should design everything for that pyramid. And, it's, and that's somehow natural. It's, it's somehow natural mm -hmm. and it's so unnatural and it's so wrong and it is so deeply the problem that we, I call it the tyranny of the 1% and we absolutely have to confront it. Mm -hmm. What happens to the middle American states when the Ogallala Aquifer is gone? Because it underlines, lies, what, 12, 15 states? The Ogallala Aquifer is the aquifer that feeds America, but it also feeds much of the world. It's a $200 billion uh, industry. It's a huge industry. And it is... Um, Agriculture. It, it, in culture, in, yeah. in terms of food, yeah, uh, food yeah. exports. Because it's not just that it feeds Americans. It grow, they grow a tremendous amount of corn. Mm -hmm. And now in the United States, 40% of all corn production must be used for corn ethanol uh, by law so that cars, to, to feed the cars. And so what they're doing is they're pumping up that aquifer water in um, the Ogallala um, using this Borwell technology. It's a circular, uh, you know, you see the crop, what look like crop circles if you fly over it. That's, that's a, a, just a, a, a very powerful way of pulling up uh, the water 24-7. There are 200,000 of these bore wells around the, the Ogallala Aquifer, and they're pumping every day, all week, every night, all, all the time, pumping this water up. When it's gone, what will they do? I, I don't think anybody's even beginning to deal with it. There was a time, I think about 20 years ago, when there was talk of introducing a law that would say that they couldn't take up, the farmers couldn't take up more than was being replenished, and so they would have to cut their quota in half. 
um, but it just you know the politics, the the political power of these of these farm uh, industries and these farm sectors just wouldn't allow it to happen. And I, so I presumably witnessed this. if we had a Canadian company in there, we could sue about oh, that. Oh sure. Yeah. And here, see, and I, I remember being in Australia because Australia's done this. Australia, the Americans should look at Australia. That's where they should look. California and the American Midwest and the American Southwest sh and the American Southeast should all look at Australia because they have basically one huge water source. The Murray Darling River comes together. Har sometimes doesn't reach the ocean anymore because it is siphoned off to grow cotton, to grow corn, to produce wine that goes all over the world. And this is mostly for export. And they have drained the Murray Darling dry, these huge, huge industrial farms. Like we're not talking mom and pa farms here, we're talking huge industrial farms. And I remember about four years ago, and I was in um, uh, uh, Australia, and uh, that was the summer that they um, bottom fell out of the rice farm because they just th they ran out of rice that w or, or, or ran, sorry ran out of water that was the year of the, the terrible drought, and I remember this rice farmer woman crying in my arms saying why didn't the government tell us why didn't they tell us and we could have at least cut our use in half and maybe we wouldn't have made as much money but it would have been better in the long run and I didn't say to her because she was crying in my arms. Yours was the lobby that wouldn't let them do this. You know, wh who is it that's looking 20, 30 years, who is looking seven generations ahead? We are literally using up the water in some of these aquifers. And it's not just places like that. The Great Lakes, I was just recently on Lake Huron where they're talking about putting, uh, burying radioactive nuclear waste in a depository a kilometer from Lake Huron, a kilometer from Lake Huron, which is horrible. And but just to stand on Lake Huron and to see where the high water mark used to come and where it is now. I mean, a study, another study said that if um, the groundwater and the water being pumped around the Great Lakes is the same, is at the same level and intensity as groundwater pumping around the world, the Great Lakes could be bone dry in 80 years. And this is a global study led by a highly respected scientist, Mark Birkins. So, you know, we have other examples of where large bodies of water are gone. If you have, it's what David Suzuki calls exponential destruction. You, it's not one and one and two and two so that you can count it and see it. It's, it's, six, it's eight times eight, it's, you know, and then it's that times whatever, and it's, you don't see it coming. And that's my, um, my fear, my, 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 I mean, we go back to trade. I, uh, the, the way I got into water was that I noted in that first free trade agreement, that Canada-US free trade agreement, that water was listed as a tradable good. And I thought, how could that be? How could water be tradable? What are they talking about? Well, it didn't take long for me to figure out what they were talking about. And they about. denied it, of course. <clears throat> they denied it, and here's what it was. It was not in the body of the trade agreement. It was referred to in a previous agreement under the old general agreement on, on uh, trade and tariffs on what constituted a tradable good and was right there. It was, it was done before. I didn't even notice it all those years before. I noticed it for the first time in the Canada-US free trade agreement. So I went back and I said, well, what's a tradable good? And I looked and there it was, water in all its forms, including ice and snow. There it was. Um, and so we launched a campaign to try to get that taken out, of course, along with many other things. And then it was included in NAFTA. And now it's regularly included in all the agreements, and hence we see this. But it's part of the same attitude that water is just here for our convenience, our pleasure, and our profit. And it doesn't have any rights of its own, and it doesn't, it's not really a common heritage. The big move now and the one that we're fighting is to have water put out on the open market like oil and gas and have it move to a, com a commodity uh, market price and a commodity trading system to buy and trade uh, water on the open market. And I have quotes uh, in my book from <coughs> uh, different business people and economists who say one day water will be traded around the world just like oil is. So, you know, it, it's not a far, far-fetched jump to say if you first of all see it as a tradable good and then you see it as private property um, to be controlled by a cartel and that's what we're fighting that's the issue that we're fighting here as we're watching the water stocks dwindle 
Let's talk a little bit about some of the victories before we go on to talk about the future of water, but because I think at this stage of the game, one could be extremely depressed, right? Uh, you, you, have, you have what seems to be um, a suicidal form of organization, a corporate form of organization, destroying the environment out of which it came and destroying it for all the people who are, um, well, for everybody, right? Um, but there have, you have, we have had some successes. We mentioned the multilateral agreement on investment. There have been many successes, and I wouldn't for a, mo a moment want to say that we've ceded all the power. <laughs> we've fought back uh, on so many fronts. Uh, we stopped the expansion of the of North American Free Trade Agreement to the Americas. It was called the Free Trade Area of the Americas. We absolutely won, hands down, the multilateral agreement on investment, and when the government of France pulled out they said that they, our movement had better legal opinions, better publicity, better research, and that they would listen to us before they'd listen to their own <laughs> trade experts, which was lovely. Um, we, we have, working with governments in the Global South, brought the World Trade Organization to its knees. That's why these regional trade agreements, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership and this European uh, agreement, that's why they're moving away, because we have absolutely brought the WTO to a standstill. So there has been a huge fight back, and I want to say that on the ground, from the ground up, there really is a new understanding of how these international institutions and these trade agreements and these investment agreements are affecting people's lives. And so we get Australia uh, passing a law against investor state. They will not sign an agreement now. We have Brazil, although they never passed a law, they refuse to sign any agreement that has investor state in it. So, you know, same with Bolivia, same with Ecuador. A number of countries are saying we will not enter into agreements based on these kind of principles. And in fact, there's an alternative trade block growing in South America that includes a number of countries that's, that talk about how they can work together to each do the best that they do and share that and yes, trade that. And of course, they're not against prosperity, but not at the expense of the human rights or the environmental protections uh, in their communities. So we have many, many, many um, examples of, of winning. And on the waterfront, well, the big one was that we got the United Nations to recognize the human right to water and sanitation, which was a <clears throat> two-decade fight, <laughs> um, which, our, uh, which our government led the fight against. Our government led, particularly under the Harper government, led the opposition against. Um, but we were successful mm, in... Stop for one second there, yes. because what you have just said, I think, deserves to be underlined. The government of Canada yes. led the fight to prevent yeah. the human right to water being recognized yeah. as a human right. Yeah, we were the last country in the world to finally adopt it. It's just appalling. I had the honor yeah. in uh, we 2000... We used to be leaders in these things, and now we're 2008, there. 2009, I had the <coughs> honor of being a senior advisor on water to the 63rd president of the UN General Assembly, Miguel Descado Brockman. He comes from Nicaragua. He's a liberation theologian priest and a wonderful man, and he had promised if he ever got in any kind of position of power that he would work to have the right to water recognized. And he and I worked with Pablo Solo, who was then the ambassador from Bolivia. Um, and on July 28, 2010, I was there, um, the United Nations did in fact vote overwhelmingly to support um, this resolution. Canada did not vote against it, it um, uh, with, uh, withheld, it, it, you know, it abstained, abstained um, as did 40 <laughs> other countries. Um, but, but Canada behind the scenes, and I was told this by co country after country, well, it's your country that's leading the fight against it. Canada does not want to expand the notion under the Harper government, does not want to expand the concept of human rights, and also we have the appalling condition of water and sanitation on so many First Nations communities in Canada, and the Harper government did not want them to have a tool to be able to turn around and say, see, this is... Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, we now have a, a, a new a new right that you're not um, you're not honoring. But well, it was really right it, it was person. it was really embarrassing at the United Nations to be there in that lovely position. It was an unpaid position. It was volunteer position, but still to have access to what I had the all the agencies working with water, all of the governments around the world moving this thing. It was so exciting. And having people say to me, but your country, what, go back home and do something with your country. I'd say, we're trying, right? We're just we're mightily embarrassed. But that was a huge win. 
And we've had a number of countries since uh, and, uh, amend their constitutions to recognize the human right to water and sanitation. We've had court cases. The Kalahari Bushmen of uh, Botswana used the um, United Nations resolution to regain their water rights in the desert after a many decade fight against a genocide attempt. Um, it was terrible. So really, we ha we're beginning to see a, a, a quite a, a turnaround. And we're also seeing that many, many municipalities around the world are taking back their water, public water services from private companies. Um, and it's, it's happening so quickly in Europe, which is really interesting, and in France particularly, that there's a whole website on the remunicipalization re of, of water services. So there's bottled water fights. We have in Canada something called the Blue Communities, which is where a municipality votes itself to um, be a caretaker of water, to promote water as a public trust, recognize it as a human right, not to promote bottled water, but to promote their own public, safe, clean tap water. So I see a counter movement to all of this, and I see these big trade agreements and these big corporations and the politicians that back them as a kind of dinosaurs. And I really do think something is going to break through here. I, I, I just have this, I think that this system has been so discredited. And you talked about water, Donald, about um, you know water being a, an access point. Anybody can understand almost anything through the lens of water. You can understand health through watching a sick child uh, because they drank dirty water. You can understand justice when you see that these kids are sick or dying because their parents can't afford it, and if they could afford it, they'd have all the water they wanted, right? I mean, you, you, you can see the environmental issues. You can see, you, you can argue about urban planning. It, and what I call for now is the, a new, what I call a new water ethic, where we put water in the center of our lives and we ask ourselves for all policies and practices, be it energy, food production, you name it, ec economic, policy, whatever, social policy, what's the impact on water? And if it's hurting water in a world running out of water, where the demand is going straight up and the supply is going straight down, you better reevaluate. And that's a big job. That's a big thing that we have to turn around. But I think if we can do it for water, it can open doors for other things, which is why I say that water can teach us how to live differently together. There's a... Um, there's a collision that seems absolutely implicit and, and, and approaching where all the economics runs up against the hard reality of, of Mother Earth and her, and her needs and limitations, right? So, which is laid behind my question about what happens when the Ogallala Aquifer actually disappears. Isn't that the point at which uh, uh, you could not possibly come forward with these kinds of yeah. of plans yeah. based on pure economics to somebody who hasn't got drinking water and can't yeah, grow right. crops. Right? Yeah. Isn't that the... Is well, that you can even, the you can even approach, the approach them on the economic issue. How can you grow something with no water? I mean, if mm -hmm. we don't look after the environment, there's no economy either. I, I just so reject this notion that it's the economy or it's the environment. If we, if we destroy our soil and water and... I mean, look what happened in the Dust Bowl. I mean, they, the, they removed all the prairie grass and it, remo it removed, so then the, the soil water dried up and the topsoil dried, blew away all over the plains, mm -hmm. the Great Plains. If we hadn't done that, if we had understood that connection, we wouldn't have had that crisis. And it's coming again, in fact, I believe. Um, so the, I think it's a really false dichotomy to, as I'm sure you know, to, to say that it has to be one or the other. It's the lack of questioning what happens when that happens. And so many of us are talking now about taking it a step further than saying water is a, a commons or a common heritage or a public trust, which we assert. Therefore, it has to be much more equitably shared. Um, on a, and it must be, uh, I argue, fiercely protected. And we have to have uh, standards for access. And if you're going to pollute it, you don't get it. If you're going to overuse it, you don't get it. You shouldn't get it for certain stupid things like bottled water etc right mm -hmm. but but what but it's that's still a, a concept that says it must be there fairly for all of us it still sees it in human-centric terms but what would it look like if we could say 
our laws, mostly in the Western world particularly, see water as property. And so it's only in relation to us that we can even protect it or even claim to protect it. Look at what Harper's doing on the environmental assessment. You have to prove that you have a monetary or commercial interest in that pipeline, the water that that pipeline might go over to even be allowed to speak at a National Her Energy Board hearing, right? It's awful. There's no such thing as just caring or, or a community's right to have a say. Um, so if we could turn that around, what, what would it be like if we could say, well, uh, you know, we have to start making our laws more compatible with the laws of nature. What rights do nature have? What rights do water have? What rights do, does a watershed have? Uh, outside of its usefulness to us, are there other um, species dependent on it? You bet. Are, is there an ecosystem that's dependent on it and by the way that gives us life? You bet. Could we turn our heads around to ask what our behavior and what our policies and what our, what our practices are doing, the way we live our lives, what is it doing to, to these watersheds? And if we could turn our heads around, it would be miraculous. I mean, what would it look like if, if the Gulf of Mexico could sue British Petroleum? I mean, obviously they couldn't, but what if we had laws that well, we could. humans could, you know, in yeah. theory, certainly. You well, know. humans could, could yes. Absolutely. Yeah, Chris, Christopher Stone at exactly. the USC exactly. has this exactly. whole thing about getting appointed as stewards and then being yeah. able to sue on exactly. behalf of natural exactly. creatures. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And people mock this. They'll say, oh, you're saying I can't fish. And I say, no, you can fish, but you cannot fish a, 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 a species to extinction. You know, it, it's, it's, and yes, there's a commercial use for this water, but you cannot, pollute this wall, you, you know, this mining company cannot turn around and kill this lake in the name of, uh, you know, economics as, as they're doing now under changes to the Fisheries Act. They're allowed to have a name, a, a lake renamed a tailings impoundment area. This is in Canada. This is one of the many wonderful things Harper's brought us so that it's no longer a lake and therefore it's no longer in any way protected. Um, these, are, you know, this is a way of looking at the world that, you know, is killing the world. And so this question you ask about what will they do when the Ogallala's gone, I have no idea. But I'll tell you, the United States is in trouble. Uh, there are 46 states. Uh, you know how many states there are. There are a lot of states mm -hmm. that are either in some crisis now or in predicted to be in future crisis within 50 years. And this is the U.S. Over geological. Over water specifically. Over water. Yeah. This is U.S. geological. 46 out of 50. All of them. Basically yeah. all of them. Yeah. Even the northern states, you know, it's so this notion that we're a planet that can't run out ha has got to be challenged. So my thinking is, and uh, you know, the principles upon which I think we need to build a water secure future or is that water is a human right. Water is a public heritage that must not be privatized, commodified, sold, bought and sold, but must be uh, fiercely protected for the greater good of all. Uh, that water has rights too, and that we have to start making our human laws and, and, and uh, behaviors compatible with, with nature. We have to restore and protect watersheds. That is, on the climate, by the way, that is as, as important, in my opinion, as, as, as stopping greenhouse gas emissions. And then we need to see that water can teach us how to live together. If, if these systems are killing water, they're killing other things too, and they are creating deep inequality. And if we can come together around water, to say, well, I won't talk to you about religion or politics or history because maybe we, you know, our, our families were warring over this for our communities or our countries or whatever, but if we don't save this watershed, we're all gone. It doesn't matter, you know, who's right and who's wrong in this struggle. Watershed gone, we're gone. And it, it, are there examples of, of ways that we can come together and just put that stuff aside and just come together to save this water on, on a new set of principles. And I believe there are, and I think that's what you know, I ask about hope, that's mm -hmm. what gives me hope, is that notion that we can do this very, very differently. You've just given us a kind of a pre of the new book, Blue Future, right? It's on my mind. I, yeah, <laughs> no, that's a wonderful sort of short version of it, and I hope it'll prompt a lot of people mm -hmm. to go out and, and, uh, and read it. You Thank know. you. Isn't one of the ironies, and I think this may also be in the book, I, as you know, I haven't seen the book yet, but um, it's one of the deep ironies that Alberta is the province in Canada which is most vulnerable to this whole situation and it's also the province from which this anti-human, anti-life 
um, and governing movement has, uh, has proceeded. What happens in Alberta? Tell me about the... Alberta is a very interesting risk. case. Mm -hmm. Alberta's at risk, and I believe Alberta is the first, will be the first water have-not province in our country. They have the destruction of the water in the tar sands, which if, they, if the increase in the growth as predicted continues to happen, will be exponential. They're talking about five-fold five increase in production, five-fold increase in the destruction of water, which is already happening. Then in the south, they have the uh, farming, their massive farming, which continues to use a great deal of water. And again, this is virtual water, particularly meat, the, their beef industry, which they want to expand through these trade agreements with Europe and other places. So they're promoting the expansion of trade agreements to the expense of their water. In Alberta, they produce two-thirds of the food in Canada made by irrigated uh, water with only 2% of the, of the country's water. So, I mean, th there's something going to have to give here. What's giving is that they're going to bring in a very right wing or looking to bring in a very right wing way to deal with this and it's called water markets. And that's where you convert licenses to a form of property and you, al you allow the owners of this water, the license, to, they're not paying uh, a license to use it anymore to the people who are the owners, the public trust, they're actually trading these uh, licenses, these properties. They're called water markets and water trading. Um, and basically what, where that's happened in Chile and in Australia in particular, those are the two that have taken this concept the furthest, water's become almost totally corporately controlled. In Australia, the price of water went up so high when they converted um, their their licenses to water markets, and then the big big you know, agribusiness ind industries bought out the small farmers, and then the investors came in, and then the foreign investors came in, and the price of water skyrocketed to the point where the government of Australia couldn't buy the water back because to 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 try to save the Murray darling I mean so you ha here's a situation where you have the market totally controlling the price of water and so how do municipalities compete in Chile the big Canadian mining com companies come in and they auction for public water and they and they they outbid local communities local indigenous people local villages who are just left without water so we we Alberta is A, in trouble, B, totally abusive of its water, and C, looking to the wrong answer for uh, the future of water. Instead of conservation, <clears throat> instead of watershed restoration, instead of uh, husbanding the limited water they have, they're just acting like it's just a total free-for-all. And uh, it's going to be, there, it's going to be the, the hot spot first in Canada. Well, you know, when you, when you talk about, I think, Chile a moment ago, you have the, the mining companies outbidding the municipalities for water. What happens to, to the people in those municipalities? Well, how does that one? They die, you know? I mean, every, yeah. every day, <coughs> somewhere, <coughs> now this isn't from lack of water necessarily, it's from dirty water as well, but somewhere in the global south, every three and a half seconds, a child dies of waterborne disease. They, they die. They do without. They, they move to uh, peri-urban slums. That's why the countryside is being depleted or being replaced by these big mines and stuff. They move into these awful slums on the outskirts of these massive cities. And I mean, I'm sure you've seen seen them there. And they're they're <coughs> unrecognized settlements. And so governments do not put in the facilities, often they don't have the money, but they try not to recognize them formally because then they would have, they're would they supposed to put in sewage and water treatment, health, uh, education, schools, and so on. I mean, there's a toilet so in Mumbai. you can Mumb move those people outside the range of human society, Absolutely. Right? There's a, one toilet in Mumbai that serves over 5,000 people, one toilet. Technically, mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't. Obviously, people defecate wherever where but technically to. there is a toilet that now s that serves that many people so where do they go they're the poor of the world they're the ones who don't matter that's and that's who we were fighting for when we were fighting for the human right to water that no no use of that water can supersede that's the theory that no mm -hmm. use of that water can su supersede it's it the fundamental legal entitlement of people to it for life no other use can, can, can supersede that. Now, do governments buy it? Some do, some don't. Even once Chile voted for it, 
uh, the human right to water, but it's, they've privatized all their water services. 100% of their water services are privatized, but they also actually sell off the water itself, which is a step beyond. I guess what I'm thinking about is, is uh, um, if people start dying in Alberta, yeah. what happens now? Right? You know, if, well, I mean, I, you can't really answer that one, but you know what I mean? It's, yes. It seems like that's <clears> and where the, fact the sharp is, end of the stick The really sharp end in. of the stick is Alberta, again, I look to Australia, where people have moved out of the rural areas into the cities, and um, they import water, bottled water, from other places. I mean, you know, that's one of the ways you do it. If you're wealthy enough, you can just buy your water. The, it, in the Global South, it's the combination of not having the money and not having the water. If you have one or the other, you're, you may be okay. If you've got clean water in your area, you can use that water. If you've got money, you can bring it in somehow. But if you have neither, you're dead. So in Alberta, it's going to be a long time, I think, before anyone is poor enough to be dying of dirty water, except that I would argue that a lot of the First Nations would say that their people are dying. Um, the, the Cree uh, around uh, Athabasca are, uh, would argue, and I think with justification, that they're dying of, of dirty water. Um, but I'll tell you, this notion that it's only in the Global South that these cutoffs are taking place. In Detroit, um, they have cut off the water services to close to 100,000 people um, because they can't pay, mostly African Americans, single mothers, elderly people. Um, and they go out and they have buckets and they go to local parks and they turn the water on and they lug the water home, just like people in the Global South do. And the big issue in a lot of the southern countries in Europe now is the austerity measure, which they're using the European Union, uh, is, or European Commission, um, is using to force um, uh, privatization of water services and, and water hikes. <laughs> and people are having their water cut off, a lot of people in, uh, in some of the southern countries. So, you know, this notion that it's far away and could never happen here is, is not true. As we become more divided by rich and poor as people find that more and more of their basic food and shelter is taking up all of their income and you're going to start to see water prices rise because of our destruction of water and our need to all the different ways it's going to the price is going to rise you're going to start to see that happening in, in rich countries as well. Maude Barlow, a Canadian icon whose long career of critical thinking, honesty and courage freshens the very definition of the word citizen. If you enjoyed her analysis of the dangers of corporate power, you may want to look at our interviews with the U.S. citizen activist David Corton, or the Scottish theologian, land reformer, and environmentalist Alistair McIntosh. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. See you soon.